Right, hello, welcome to the abdominal exam, quick summary. Uh, so, when we talk about the, um, the major OSCE exams, these Objective Structured Clinical Examinations, as it stands for, we're particularly concerned with a very sort of formulaic process. So you're beginning with wiping, which is wash your hands, introduce yourself, patient details, explain the procedure to get consent. Okay? We then have a general sequence called the general inspection or the end of bed inspection and the general examination. Now your general examination is where you begin with the hands, you move on to the wrist, so you can take pulses, blood pressures, you look at the arms, you look at the armpits, you move to the face, then the neck. Okay, so it's a very formulaic order. Work your way from the hands, so step away, end of bed inspection, and then move towards the hands, grab the hands, have a look, move your way up the upper limb, face down to the neck. We then have inspection, where you look at the region you're concerned with, palpation, where you touch the region you're concerned with, percuss, where you tap it, and then auscultation, where you listen. I'm getting called. <laughs> Sorry. Um, right, so... At the top is the breadcrumb trail, so we'll be able to follow our way through. So in the wiping process, it's four things, as we've said. Wash hands and introduce yourself. Check the patient's details, and we're looking for two-factor authentication. So name, date of birth, or date of birth and full address, or first line of the address, or whatever. It's very trust-specific. We're then going to explain the examination and gain informed consent, and we'll position the patient appropriately. So nothing here is unique to the abdominal exam. This is the same for the cardiovascular exam, or the respiratory exam, but this is the sort of general formula. So general inspection, end of bed inspection. So we'll begin with the contents of the bed, aka the patient, and then outside of the bed. So the actual inspection of the patient for the um, abdominal exam can be remembered with the, with the mnemonic jam, like a jam preserve. So jaundice, Abdominal distension and their effect, are they agitated, are they depressed, you know, what kind of mood are they in? Is a lethargy? Uh, any masses that are visible? Can you see any visible scars of any type? And we will go into the different scars shortly. And then swelling, or lack thereof. Okay, so now we've done the sort of patient-wide thing, so now we're looking for medical paraphernalia. And I've listed a few here, so any kinds of tubes or stomas, any kinds of drains or other medical devices that you might see, including the gas and air, the meds, all these different kinds of things. So we'll move on to a general examination and then inspection. We're going to begin with the hands, we'll go to the arms, then the axilla, we'll do the face, the neck, and then finally the chest and the abdomen. That's what we are inspecting. So let's start with the hands. These are some of the major things that we are going to be looking for at a glance. So clubbing, the mnemonic to remember the, f the causes of clubbing is clubbing. We're not going to get through those now, um, but make sure you give that a quick Google. This is what clubbing looks like. We lose the angle of the nail bed. Then we have leukonychia, which is hypoalbuminemia, and this presents with these little white spots here. Coilonychia or colonychia, which is chronic iron deficiency. And it's this sort of spooning cavitation of the nail bed. Palmar erythema, which is liver disease or pregnancy. So a big surge of estrogen, basically. Deuterans contracture. Alcohol and family history. So the fourth and fifth digits here are passively flexed at the proximal joints. And then liver flap or asterixis is associated with alcohol and cirrhosis. And you test it by having the patient hold their arms out straight like that with their fingers spread as far apart as possible. If the fingers aren't spread far apart, you're going to fail this station because if the fingers are together, they can support themselves and reduce the amount of flap. Okay? So let's move on to the arm itself, and we're looking for three different things. I can never pronounce this word. Petechia or petechia. It's where you have the low platelets and you get this sort of spotty type bleeding. So this is what it would look like on the upper limb, for instance. Compare that with excoriations, which are scratch marks, which are indicative of cholestasis, right? So as your, um, as your unconjugated bilirubin starts to deposit in the skin as a result of a cholestatic obstruction, 
um, or just reduced movement or flow uh, in the recycling of the enterobiliary circulation. Don't worry if you don't know that, just review a bit of GI physiology there. But when the bilirubin starts to deposit in the skin, it's very itchy, so they're scratching. Track marks, so you'll see these in uh, intravenous drug users. So this is, you're immediately thinking risk of hepatitis, risk of HIV. So you need to be thinking, how is this affecting the GI system? So you might say, I'm not seeing any excoriations, I'm not seeing any track marks. The examiner can stop you and say, why would you be worried about excoriations? And you have to say cholestasis, because unconjugated bilirubin could be depositing. Okay? So let's move to the armpits, and there's a couple of things. So your classic lymphadenopathy. But then this thing called acanthosis nigricans, okay? Now this is if you're obese, or it's also a sign for completely for not completely sure regions, reasons of GI cancer. So this dark pigmentation area where the cracks in the skin are, so like the folds in the skin. So that's a very classic sign that comes up a lot in exams. Hair loss is malnourished or iron deficiency, okay? So you might say that they're looking a bit bald there where they wouldn't be and you'd say you know have you have you waxed or shaved this region recently no it fell out okay that could be a sign of some malnourishment going on here okay so we're moving on to the um the face as we've said and we're looking at the eyes we're looking at the mouth the eyes we're looking for the usual so you lower the eyelids to look for um pallor of the conjunctiva to indicate anemia Elevate those um, the, the eyelids to look for jaundicing of the sclera. Then you can look for signs of um, hyperlipidemia. Uh, and the particular stigmata you would see as xanthelasma, these sort of like little spots. The mouth, you're looking for angular stomatitis, which are the sort of little reddy areas around the canthi, which is iron or B12 deficiency. Looking for oral candidiasis, which are these white spots. Mouth ulcers, IBD, and that's particularly Crohn's over UC. Um, and then, of course, glossitis, so erythema. So I remember that as moat. Mouth ulcers, oral, angular stomatitis, and then tongue glossitis. So glossitis is sort of inflammation of the tongue. So you'd see that in sort of erythema of B12 folate deficiencies. Okay, so we move on to the neck now, and you need to be able to palpate the lymph nodes. Now, we did this in the actual, um, in the teaching session, so remember that you're going for your submental, your submandibular, your preauricular, your parotids, then your tonsillar at the angle of the mandible, or just sort of superior to it. Don't forget your posterior auricular, don't forget your occipital chain, moving to your superficial chain, and your deep uh, cervical chain, and then make sure you have the patient lift up the shoulders and then protrude the shoulders forward so you can feel in that supraclavicular fossa for um, the, the lymph nodes, and particularly looking for trossier sign. Now here's a particularly um, strong example of the foregut mets, so this is a very large um, lymphadenopathy associated with uh, trossier sign, which is the sentinel lymph node in the supraclavicular fossa. So now we're looking at an inspection of the chest itself, and you can remember this with s like a snake hissing because it's seven S's, basically. So you can't go wrong if you're thinking about those things. So we've got spider nevi, stria, stoma, scars, swelling, two signs, and spironolactate or steroid-induced gynecomastia. So let's split them up. We've got the first four, spider nevi, here, if you press this center spot, all of these stop perfusing and become pale. They let go and they reappear. This is um, portal hypertension, indicative of liver cirrhosis or some obstruction in the uh, portal system. Striae, with, oh, so, yep, so chronic liver disease, striae, distension or stretch marks. So if you've had any weight changes recently, you're going to have the stretch marks. If there's any sort of ascites that has come and gone, then you might have those striae as well. A stoma, if it's in the left iliac fossa, which this one is, it's going to be from the colon, and if it's uh, colostomy, sorry, and if it's the right iliac fossa, it's usually an ileostomy or a urostomy. And then scars. So we have abdominal scars that are in the learning outcomes, and there's a few that you need to know. So you need to know the median, the paramedian, and the median is through the um, linear alba, so it 
is um, it is relatively avascular, so it's slow to heal, prone to infection, but won't bleed. Okay, and you're not going to be hitting structures if you need to get in there quickly. Paramedian is going to heal a little bit quicker, but it's going through muscle, it's going through the tendinous intersections of the rex abdominis muscle, so it's going to be a bit more damaging. So you then have a few different more incisions here. So this one, your subcostal one up here, is to access the, the, the flexure here, the splenic flexure of this region on this side. It could be used for um, a gallbladder operation. Uh, no, sorry, yeah, a gallbladder operation. This one here will be doing um, the classic McBurney's point, which is something you need to revise, which is uh, sort of an ablation of the appendix. And then this uh, pubic, suprapubic or fansteel approach is um, for C-sections. So make sure you know those. Those are some scars to see. In terms of swelling, we're talking about ascites, obesity and pregnancy. Signs to be observed are Cullen and Gray Turner. Okay, so your Cullen sign is a para umbilical bruising around here, and your Gray Turner is more flank pain, more flank pain, sorry, more flank bruising here. This is indicative of retroperitoneal bleed. So you're thinking immediately pancreatitis or a triple A abdominal aortic aneurysm rupture. Okay. And then this kind of speaks for itself. So spironolactone and steroid induced gynecomastia is also caused by digoxin and breast cancer. Okay, so these are the S's that we are thinking of. So in palpation, you're going to lightly palpate each of the nine regions listed here. And you're going to be looking at the patient for any tenderness. Particularly when you push down and lift off, you're looking for um, any guarding as you push down, and then you're looking for any rebound tenderness. If you, if they're guarding as you push down, that means that it's probably a bit sore, a bit deeper. As you lift off, if they're in pain from the lift off, the rebound tenderness that tends to be as you over as you stretch out the um the the the, the parietal peritoneum. So it's more of a peritonitis sort of thing that's going on. Okay, make sure that you're looking to see if there's any liver edge here. So you're going to be palpating various different things here. We'll get to, yes, so make sure you know the nine different regions and these different planes, as well as the quadrants that are used a bit more in the emergency theatre. So you're palpating six different um, organ structure things. You're palpating the liver first, which we did, and you start from... The, uh, the iliac region here on the right side, and you move up and up and up and up and up. The patient has takes a big breath in, and that causes the diaphragm to flatten. Well, it causes the lungs to expand, which pushes the liver down, the liver edge down on the right costal margin. So you can feel that. You shouldn't be able to feel a liver edge ordinarily. So if you can, it indicates a pattern megaly. Same with the spleen, splenomegaly. It should be down here behind the 9 through, the, th nine through 11th rib on the left-hand side. Um, so you start again in the right of the fossa and you move in a sort of J shape up to the spleen here. For the gallbladder, you go for Murphy's point, which is the ninth intercostal space, midclavicular line on the right side, and you push down on there to see if you can feel it. Not really sure how good that is as a sign for evidence base anymore, but it's still performed. And then balloting the kidney where you have one hand at the angle of the kidney and another hand above it. So one hand posterior, one hand anterior, and you try to push the kidney between them as we demonstrated in the lecture. For the urinary bladder, you should have tap from the pubic region up or you can tap going down. You shouldn't ordinarily be able to palpate for the urinary bladder. So if you can, it would indicate that there's probably some obstruction going on and they're at risk of sort of overflow incontinence and things. Um, and then you feel for the aorta. Now you feel for the aorta bilaterally, you put your hands and then press down. You usually have to press down quite hard unless they're quite thin. Um, so if the body habitus is quite large, you're gonna have to push down quite a bit, sort of supralateral and bilaterally to the umbilicus. And if you push down, you should be able to feel a sort of like throbbing sensation. If your hands start to move apart laterally, that's indicative of an aneurysm, quite a large aneurysm. Again, how good is that 
um, juries out, you're probably still selling them for imaging, aren't you? If you chance it. So, so, so pal, uh, oh gosh, let me go back. So, um, those are the things we palpate for six. You don't percuss all six, you percuss three of them. You percuss the liver, you percuss the spleen, and you percuss the, the urinary bladder. So, um, you also are going to be percussing uh, for visible ascites with a shifting dullness, basically. So you will do the classic um, percussion. Do, 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 do. It will get duller when you start to feel, um, when you hear fluid. So you start from here. Boom, 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 boom. It gets duller, duller, duller. So you stop. You keep a note of where it should be. You turn the patient ninety degrees and they lie there. You should turn the patient toward you. Otherwise, it'll fall off if you turn them the other way. Give it about 30 seconds, I believe they say, 30 seconds. And there should be a transition point. So you should be able to hear resonant, 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 and then it starts to get dull. So it will have shifted. And it's this shifting dullness concept that is indicative of quite a large amount of ascites. So this doctor here is making a mistake in that he has turned the patient away from him. So this patient could quite easily fall. Um, off the bed. So you should turn the patient towards you. It's the best practice. Then oscillation, you're oscillating two things. You're going to listen for bowel sounds, which is normally just generically in the left iliac fossa, um, although every clinician I've ever seen has done it completely differently. Um, and then you're listening for aortic bruise supralateral to the umbilicus. Okay? The rule for bowel sounds is if you can't hear anything, you listen for two minutes. Okay? If you can't hear anything then you record it okay but if you can hear something you can stop as soon as you hear it okay so the other day i was listening for bowel sounds put the bell on the patient and within two seconds i heard a grumbly sound boom the patient has bowel sounds you don't need to keep listening for two minutes okay so that is that. Um, in terms of final checks, you're going to be checking the front and the back of the patient. So you're going to be doing an external genitalia exam, looking at the hernial orifices and doing a DRE. And there we are. That's it. That's the abdo exam. So best of luck. Have a go at the questions below and uh, see you next time.